Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Bomber here. I'm excited today to bring a special edition to the Trending in Ed feed. As I mentioned on recent episodes, we will be releasing a new dedicated feed focusing on the future of work. For today's episode of the main feed of Trending in Ed, I'm going to include our first episode summarizing what's on the horizon in the first installment. It's going to be 12 episodes, lots of amazing guests. Hopefully folks will be interested. If you are, you can find a dedicated playlist on trendingined.com. You can look for Trending in Ed, the Future of Work series feed as a dedicated feed wherever you get your podcasts. All of that's on the horizon. Thanks as always for listening. We'll pick up now with a special treat. The first episode of Trending in Ed, the Future of Work series. We hope you enjoy. Hi, this is Mike Palmer, the founder of Palmer Media and the host of Trending in Education, the podcast from which this series is being born. We've been doing Trending in Ed since the fall of 2016, coming up on 500 episodes. We've been intentionally broad in our focus so far. With the launch of this dedicated feed on the future of work, we're going to begin to go deep into some of the categories and topics that we've had the most interesting conversations, delved the most deeply, touched on topics and themes that are particularly relevant in the transformative times that we're living in. That is culminating in the launch of Trending in Ed, the Future of Work series. Thankfully, I'm not alone. I will be joined by Ruth, my virtual co-host. Ruth, welcome to the Future of Work series. Thanks, Mike. I've enjoyed appearing on Trending in Ed as the higher ed and lifelong learning expert. So it makes perfect sense to get me working on the Future of Work series with you. We've got quite a lineup of episodes for our first installment of this series. We wanted to spend some time in this first episode showcasing and highlighting many of the voices we'll be going deep within this first season. Where do you want to start? There's quite a lot to choose from. Yes, there is, Ruth. I guess to start, we're going to go back to February of 2021 when I interviewed Michelle Weiss, who had recently written the book Long Life Learning. It's an excellent read. I've referred back to it several times on Trending in Education. One of the reasons why I love doing these interviews with authors and thought leaders and CEOs, folks making a difference in the world of learning, is that it kind of burns these conversations into my brain. I would say Long Life Learning is a book that stays with you, I guess, by intent. It's written with the idea that we live increasingly long lives. Those lives will involve likely multiple careers and multiple shifts from one area of focus and expertise to others. Let's pick up here with a little bit of sound from the Michelle Weiss interview, which will be featured early on in our special series on the future of work. Let's pick up with Michelle and me next. It's funny, as I was writing the book, I think some of my colleagues thought I was going to be out there with a crystal ball saying precisely the kinds of jobs that would exist in the future. And that's just impossible. We've already seen just over the last decade, these jobs emerge that are the hot jobs of today that really just didn't exist before. So the purpose of the book is not to identify the specific jobs that will be in demand in the future, but the kinds of skills and the kinds of problem solvers we need to become in order to meet that very uncertain world of work ahead. So as we think about better preparing ourselves for this very turbulent future ahead, we have to realize first that yes, there are certain skills that humans can leverage better than robots. There are certain skills that we just have to relinquish to computers and machine learning and AI just because 
they're always going to do it better, faster, and without any mistakes. There are other things that are like those more human skills or those quote unquote softer skills or non-cognitive skills, those workforce competencies around collaboration and teamwork and exercising judgment, creativity. systems thinking, yeah. right? Yeah, creativity, curiosity, all those kinds of things that we talk about that are going to be core skills needed in the future. But it's also really important that we realize that alone is not enough. We can't just bank on our human skills. In order to be someone who is truly marketable in the future, we have to have also enough of that technical or domain expertise in order to also assess the work or intervene at the right times when we're seeing how that play with artificial intelligence or mm -hmm. these different kinds of rapid technological advancements. I think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're seeing today right now with, for instance, the intense challenges you're seeing around social media, that there are all these different kinds of problems and volume impact repercussions that we didn't evaluate before letting loose the technology. And now what has happened is some of that technology has outstripped our ability to manage it. And so that's what we need to avoid in the future, making sure we're marrying our human skills and our, you know, our judgment and our ethics and our values with enough of that technological understanding, that vertical expertise. If you think about a T-shaped learner, yep. we need enough of that to be prepared to face all the different kinds of uncertain circumstances that are coming our way. Great stuff there with Michelle. I would recommend her book. We'll be covering that interview in depth as one of the early episodes in the season. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of these concepts have stuck with me, particularly that of the T-shaped learner and the importance of not just thinking about going deep within certain areas, but also having that broader cross-section of skills to pay the bills. Many of them are soft skills, frequently called power skills, also known as durable skills. Reminds me also of the conversation that we had with Jeff Gotthelf, who wrote Forever Employable, which is more from the context of the employee, his or herself. What can we be doing to plant our flag and carve out our own niche? Jeff's done really tremendous work around applying agile methodologies to UX and to thinking about career development, understanding how to measure milestones and outcomes versus outputs. Really interesting thinker. Again, I would recommend Forever Employable. Here's a little bit of sound from Jeff and I talking about why it's important to plant your flag. Absolutely. Look, every industry has a community and every community has leaders in that community, thought leaders, experts, the people that you look up to. The ability today to become one of those leaders, to become present in that conversation is easier than ever, but it does take effort. It takes effort. It takes consistency. The first part of the book is called Plant Your Flag. Mm -hmm. And really, it's the first exercise that I recommend, which is to decide what you want to be known for mm -hmm. in your community. What, what do you want to build your reputation around? And it's an exercise in right-sizing the flag that you're going to build as the foundation for your reputation and your network. You don't want to go too broad. You know, like education right. is enormous. huge. Yeah. Enormous, right? It's just way too broad, way too generic. You don't want to go too narrow, which is German language education for veterinarians. That feels like that's a little, yeah. it's niche. May, may, yeah. I mean, there's an, there's an audience and for there, it. There, right? are, there are German shepherds out there, but there are other varietals of, of pooches. So yes. Exactly. It's somewhere in between those two that leverages your passions, your expertise, and, and your experience. And then it's an effort in consistency and frequency in establishing yourself as the person who knows about that. Wherever your community hangs out, mm -hmm. participate. Mm -hmm. Participate in the conversations. Join in the conversations. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what the thought leaders are already doing. Submit to speak at one of your industry conferences. Post some ideas in the discussion forums, wherever your folks hang out, mm -hmm. and see what kind of feedback you get. Mm -hmm. Offer up a free presentation. I did one yesterday. I did a free webinar yesterday on objectives and key results. It was an hour long presentation. Mm -hmm. That's it. One hour, literally. I did 
90 minutes of prep for it. So two mm -hmm. and a half hour effort, roughly speaking. 315 people signed up, about 150 showed up, but that's a terrific way to test your ideas. Great stuff there with Jeff. Plenty of actionable morsels and insights and perspectives from a gentleman who, in his origin story, shares that he originally joined the circus early in his professional life, and he landed well. So it's another reminder that our careers take long courses through that long life learning that Michelle was talking about. Those are two episodes that are going to be featured early in the season. How about you, Ruth? What about season one, about the episodes that we have on the horizon, which of them are capturing your attention? I got a lot out of your conversations with Francis Valentin, Kumar Garg, and Beth Porter. Francis helped bring a global Kiwi perspective to the show, which I really appreciated. She focuses on new and emerging skills, but through the lens of mid-career learners looking to upskill. This reinforces how learning is so critical to staying relevant and adding value throughout our career. Let's listen to Francis a bit here. I actually just want to say that even though we're teaching adults and the average age of our students is 42, they sort of stretch from 35 and above typically. And in fact, we even have scholarships for over 60s, mm -hmm. which are very uh, high demand. A lot of people over 60 doing studies with us at postgraduate level. When I started my career, my students were undergrads and I was young, they were young. And actually all I think is I'm, all I'm doing is matching my students to my life. So I get to hang out with cool people who are the same age as me. The only time I took a break out of that was when I first started the Mind Lab in 2013, it was actually for children. It was for children aged between seven and 12 to teach them about technologies and robotics and coding and getting into that. And so there was a period of time where I did teach schools and young children, and then we've, I've gone back into higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, since that time and really focused on this underserved market of people who are mid-career or mm -hmm. wanting to really understand what their career is going to look like in the next 5, 10, 15 years, with a particular focus on people starting to realize that retirement at 65 is probably not very realistic if you're going to live to be 90. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's a lot of living, you know, the 25 years afterwards, what are you going to do? Right. How are you going to afford to live? Not that many people have a nest egg of a 25 year right. scope to look after themselves. So then we're really focused about making sure that people feel really confident about the changing world and actually what they can do to keep up with that yeah. world that's changing around them. She does a nice job of putting things into context around lifelong learning in a very authentic and empathetic way. Really enjoyed that conversation. With Kumar Garg, I was more intrigued by his ideas about investing more in research and development and engineering as they relate to education. He's doing fascinating work at Schmidt Futures. Kumar headed up the STEM education program for the Obama administration before joining Schmidt Futures. Let's listen to a bit from the Kumar show next. We're in some ways tasked with a reimagining of our educational system that is more science, technology, engineering, uh, and math forward. There's a lot of thinking about the, the the future of work and the skills gap in ways that we talked about it a bunch on this podcast over the years, but having someone who really was in some ways defining this conversation for the U.S. through the, the 2010s into the teens. And then fast forwarding a bit, although there's a lot to talk about in there, there's also this Eric Schmidt fellow who yeah. has established what you're working on today. Can you share yes. a little more of what that is? Well, yeah. So I left in 2017 and you know, started working with Eric and Eric, former CEO of Google, started working with him on what became Shrimp Futures, which is an organization that focuses on science and technology for the public good. Mm -hmm. And one of the big program areas that we've built here is something that we call learning engineering. Mm -hmm. And what it's really focused on is how do we use what are the pretty rapid advances in computer science, computational tools, computational methods, things like machine learning, yeah. and a computational talent, all the computer science talent that's happening. How do we take all of that and have it drive advances in our understanding of human learning? Mm -hmm. What allows kids to thrive in what settings? How do we take those small insights and make them into big insights? Mm -hmm. And how do we do them repeatedly? If you follow the role of computer science in other fields, across the sciences, it's starting to have this pretty profound impact. Yes, There used to be this idea that, oh, the way we understand biology is mm -hmm. we study cells and we study all these different sort of organisms. And then in the past 20 years, we have this whole field called computational biology, where right. we say, if we're trying to actually figure out the path of a disease, 
we could actually sequence a lot of genomes and say the cancer seems to really spike at this part of the genome. Yeah. That doesn't tell you the biological understanding of why that's happening, yeah. but it gives you a totally different clue as to where you might go looking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's like a data first clue finding exercise. Yeah. And that's had this big impact. So now you had just had a few months ago, this big breakthrough on protein folding mm -hmm. using a yeah. total, using a, this was like a problem that was considered unsolvable mm -hmm. uh, using these methods. So the question is, is, if you take those methods, you take that talent, how would you apply it to understandings of human learning? Mm -hmm. And the, the reason why I think this is a really interesting topic is for a long time, what learning science has actually given us are really powerful mid-level theories for learning. The good mid-level theory for learning is space repetition, yep. which is the idea that I teach you something and then you should probably come back to it because in two weeks, if I say to you, do you remember that thing I taught you? Yeah. Trying to recall it actually firm puts it more firmly back into your yeah. long -term memory. Shout, shout out to Ebbinghaus. Ebbinghaus was onto something, the forgetting curve. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So this is a powerful idea. Mm -hmm. Now the question is when should I come back? Because even if you understand like lots of research shows that space repetition matters, Yeah. should I teach it to you that night for homework? Mm -hmm. Should I bring it up tomorrow in school? Yeah. Come back in two weeks. Should I come back in two months just to double check? Right. And the thing is that if you actually add up space repetition, worked examples, all these different important learning science theories, yeah, and you start to say, which combination of them should I do? You end up with trillions of possibilities Yep, because the theories don't tell you when to do them. Not to mention, how do you measure whether it's working or not? Uh... For which student in what? Yeah. And so you, there's two ways you could think about that, that problem. You could say, we're always going to live in the world of it depends. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have amazing educators mm -hmm. and they're going to figure it out. Yeah. But I think if you take one step further, just like we have physicians who are yeah. doing really important diagnostic work when somebody walks in, but they also have this huge R and D infrastructure. Yeah. There's also just testing and taking those insights that physicians mm -hmm. are having and saying, is this a big insight? Is it small? How do these things apply? How do these drugs combine with each other? Yeah. How do these therapies combine with each other? So the idea behind learning engineering is. How do we make sure that we're actually providing teachers and parents and students the tools? Yeah. But those tools are actually testing all these different ideas at scale. So mm -hmm. you're not just saying, here's one small idea, and now I'm just going to apply it to everybody. And in education, and this is really informed by my experience of when I worked in the administration, I think in education, we're constantly chasing silver bullets. Mm -hmm. We have one insight that seems to work, and the study seems to have a real effect. And we just get so excited. We're like, we should now do this everywhere for everybody. Yeah, right. But I think we should think about it with more humility. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know, but actually what we should think about it is that insight plus a hundred other insights yeah. happening all the time is how we're actually going to make education better. Yeah. But right now, the way we set up the system is each individual research study is really small. They're expensive to set up. So you read a paper in the learning sciences and it'll be on 40 kids. It'll take two years to do, then they'll have some results. And then eventually there'll be some analysis seven years later on 50 of those papers. And by that time, education's really changed. And then people will say, well, those results from last decade, do we really know? And we'll end up with just stronger mid-level theories. If you take a company like Duolingo, mm -hmm. that is teaching how to learn a second language. Yeah. Duolingo is running a dozen experiments a day. Great stuff there with Kumar gives you a sense of what that conversation is like. We'll be picking up with more of that in a dedicated episode in the Future of Work feed shortly. Oh my goodness, don't get me started on Duolingo. That sticky feedback, really interesting stuff. I keep coming back to them as an example where why can't we do what they did with language learning in other contexts? And I think the answer might be that we just haven't started to do it yet. We haven't seen those results. There's a lot of R&D happening. Kumar really had an interesting perspective on even R&D investment, how limited that is, and why don't we have something like the old DARPA net investment that ultimately resulted in the internet. We could live in a world where there is more significant funding into the research around leveraging technology for innovation, thinking about early childhood learning, right on through long life learning. 
Really interesting ideas there. You also mentioned Beth Porter. I do know we're going to be having a new conversation with Beth soon in the main training and ed feed, and that'll likely propagate back over here. But she does really interesting work both at SMA Learning and at Rith Analytics. Here's some quick sound from the Beth episode, and then we'll transition into a lightning round as we conclude our introduction to Trending and Ed, the Future of Work series. Let's hear a little bit from Beth Porter before we hop over into the lightning round. I'm actually really glad you brought up flow because one of the things I'm super excited about professional development and learning in new modalities is game-based learning. Mm. I'm uh, super excited about the idea that I think it's just been long the reserve of kids. Like I want to reclaim games. I just yeah. want to, I'm an adult. I'm, I'm good. I love games. I'd love to be able to have that as a mechanism for learning. And I just think that the game environments are becoming mm. so much more sophisticated and there are so many social games yeah. and uh, collaborative games that are just, they're not particularly connected to professional development now. Yeah. But in these environments just give us a hugely rich space for exploring all the things that we've just been talking about. Collaboration, communication, shared goals, uh, the uh, ability to take risks and learn, all the stuff that is what we're training, that is all mindset development mm -hmm. and great ground for learning how to be with one another in a situation that's safe Mm -hmm. but it's destructive and potentially transformative. Yeah. And I'm really interested in investments in that. And when I look around and say, what am I excited about? What do I want yeah. to be coming out? I don't have to be the inventor. <laughs> I want to, I want somebody else to invent yeah. stuff that I need to do too. I look at game-based professional development, game-based learning as a really a place that's underdeveloped and people talk about it. And I don't know, mostly in the context of VR, but I think that just immersive games where you have really tangible rich, meaty problems to solve with others is a really great space for learning. Yeah, that's interesting. Even the escape room way yeah. that was going and the idea yeah. that it's an experience. Shared experiences was something that was all the rage prior to the pandemic. And then it yeah. became about social distancing. And then even that social distancing led for ways to feel more proximal yeah. digitally, which is really interesting. So where do you see things headed? Are there any trends or larger waves that you think are worth paying attention to? Yeah. So in addition to game-based learning, I think one of the other ones I'm really excited about, and, and maybe this will, maybe your, some of your listeners will be like, ah, you know, she's not thinking about it the right way, but you know, I'm not as excited about VR as everybody else is. I think one of the things that I really observe about what's important to business leaders. Let's just talk about people who are in our sweet spot. I think we have to learn more about what's around us. I develop better situational awareness, learn more from our environment, learn more from what's going on in order to be able to bring that material in yeah. and then use it as part of the information space that we use to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm keyed in on AR versus VR right yeah. now, because I think we don't, um, again, it's this underdeveloped, underutilized set of technologies. It's much easier to develop typically. It doesn't require as fancy equipment. It's a little bit more accessible. It, it, it takes advantage of or can take advantage of the base of everything that's around you that you're yeah. just blindly shooting your way through as a human and you just don't pay any attention to. Mm -hmm. And I think that that as a thing that you can use to learn from, that's something I'm super excited about. And I just don't think a lot of creative energy has been put into using it for learning. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that I'm always on the lookout for. And we are starting to actually build some capabilities around internally that we're excited about releasing next year. So AR, definitely game-based learning for sure. I'm also a big fan of using data to give feedback to learners. So all this space of predictive analytics, some colleges do it really well. Mm. So they're just like microscopically collecting data about every single, did they go to the dining hall today? Did they sign in at the basketball gym? Did they, whatever, did they chat with somebody on the internal app of the, of the school? All of that stuff sounds like, oh my gosh, it could be used for terror. Yeah, big terror. brother, yeah. Terry yeah. big brother-ish. Luckily, we have laws, at least in the United States, that protect. There is a class of data that is protected that is uh, educational data. But what I like about that, it doesn't feel big brother-ish to me, but I think it's very useful, is trying to use it to intervene to help students become more successful. And rather than simply saying, we know there's going to be summer melt. We know there's going to be attrition. We know that people are at risk. We're taking it on the chin. 
or at the erosion of standards so that you just drive more retention. I think all of those things um, are just like, that's old thinking. And really we should be thinking about how we can use data for student good mm -hmm. and for student um, health. And this is everything from mental health to just like helping them stay on track, uh, stuff about financial, all of it, the whole yeah. thing. Like yeah, yeah. Identify as the triggers for a student being more at risk than they were before and how do we intervene? I'm excited about that as it's getting that to be more pervasive and something that gets used with a little bit more clarity everywhere. Fantastic stuff. I look forward to getting Beth back on the show. She had a nice mix of leadership experience, grounded perspective, but also a real openness to generating new ideas and exploring our creative process, which again, that's a theme that is coming up. We all need to contain multiples and be able to think with both sides of our brains. We're going to shift now into the lightning round, other topics, other conversations. We may not bring back clips, but what else are you excited about in the rest of season one of the future of work for Trending in Ed? I love the stuff you did with Paul Fain and Ryan Cray, two sharp and relevant writers. Paul is a journalist and Ryan heads up a venture capital firm. They both write about new and emerging pathways into the workforce, many of which are outside of higher education. I enjoyed those conversations a lot and look forward to sharing them in this feed. And then the other area that we cover with some depth is the movement towards going skills-based in the hiring pipeline. Your interviews with Jay Oates from Working Nation and Kathleen Delasky from Education Design Lab certainly opened my eyes to the massive efforts already in process to transform how we think about skills development, skill transparency, and ways to bridge emerging skills gaps. Lots to chew on there. Yes, indeed. Ruth, I'm glad you went there. We'll also be talking to Rovi Brennan and bringing in some of our recent episodes about trends in workplace learning from Udemy and elsewhere. It's going to be a fun ride. I'm excited to go deep into the future of work with you. I'm excited to bring a little more targeted feed to our listeners who are hungry for relevant content, talking about some of these transformations around the skills economy the future of work and the way in which we continue to upskill and reskill ourselves in this long life learning ecosystem that is emerging. With that, we're going to bring this episode to its conclusion. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to this dedicated feed. You'll be getting new content. You'll be getting content curated in new and interesting ways like this conversation. And if you prefer the broader range of topics that you've come accustomed to at Trending in Ed, well, fear not, the primary feed will continue to focus on bringing the breadth and depth that is needed to stay frisky, to stay frosty, to stay ahead of trend and aware of what is new and exciting in the world of learning. Ruth, thank you for joining our listeners. Do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Ed, the Future of Work series. Thank you for listening.